All right. Uh, welcome to the PRH video series on the mental health impact of COVID-19. Uh, I'm here speaking with Jill Elbracht, the psychiatric ARMP from Palouse River Counseling. And we're going to be uh, talking about uh, not only kind of what her role is with medication management, psychiatric care, but also her kind of take and advice about general mental health and well-being. And we're really, really grateful to have you here. So thanks for, for doing this, Jill. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Uh, well, jumping in, um, just broadly, what part of this is wondering, and a lot of questions people have is, what are kind of the main considerations you might have for folks to be considering right now in just the current COVID situation as far as mental health goes? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, my messages today are really going to be about just some really fundamental ways to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, the first of those, of course, is the role that your healthcare provider plays in that. And I guess I'm speaking to both your mental health care provider, if you're already linked with one, and of course, your physical health care provider. Um, I think the community of Pullman has done an amazing job of kind of adapting and modifying what the delivery of health care looks like during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I'm really pleased with the number of clinics and providers who really come on board with doing what we're doing this morning, um, mm -hmm. meeting virtually and uh, <laughs> yeah. not meeting in person. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I know a number of clinics allow you to schedule a telehealth appointment um, if that's appropriate based on your need. So mm -hmm. um, really maintaining those connections with your providers is important um, and maybe even more important than before we knew about COVID-19. Um, well, that is a good sentiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, managing those existing conditions that you already know about yourself becomes even more important. Um, and again, I'm speaking to both the mental health aspects and physical health aspects. So folks who might already have an underlying anxiety disorder, folks who already have um, a known mood disorder, those folks really need to continue to stay on top of meeting the needs of managing those conditions. Um, the current situation is only gonna cause more stress and put more of a spotlight on those situations. So really um, be proactive. Um, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, we would much rather we would much rather be preventive or um, be in maintenance mode than be in crisis mode, and that's you know across the board for all conditions. So anything that you can do proactively, as you just said, to um, kind of stay on top of that is important. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the physical conditions play into that too. You know, things that have an inflammatory piece to them, like arthritis and those sorts of conditions. Those things flare when we're under stress too. So when your physical body is um, mm -hmm. speaking to you about those things, it's important to check in and stay on top of those things as well. Mm -hmm. And this is not an unusual time for new concerns to crop up too. You know, maybe this is the first time that you've noticed yourself waking up each morning with kind of a flutter feeling in your chest, or I'm waking up each morning mm -hmm. feeling really achy, you know, whatever it might be. And so when those, when those new symptoms, when those new concerns arise, um, it becomes even more important to check in sooner than later and to really pay attention to those cues to see um, what sort of help you might need with what's going on. I mean, what I hear is a really important theme, it sounds like, is, is, is being you know, active in, in, in your own care, being proactive, um, but monitoring and, and then kind of making sure you're not kind of going too hands off with your day to day. Um, partially because if you, you know, if, if you let, if you, things go by the wayside or if you're kind of letting things build up, like you were saying towards the beginning, there's some logistical things to consider about access to care. And so getting out ahead of things is, is important. Absolutely, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And I really empower people um, to speak up when they notice changes. Um, you're your own expert in your health. Um, mm -hmm. You can form a team of people, but you're still your own expert um, in terms of your daily living, your own body, your own moods. Um, so you really need to kind of empower yourself to, to speak up about those things when you see them and let and you know. Jill, that is a good sentiment too, because I there, you know, this whole context, I think it can be kind of... Uh, What's the word? Not disempowering, but it it can make probably make people feel to a certain extent a little helpless, like a little kind of you know mm -hmm. constrained. And so focusing on that idea that you're in control of yourself and you're probably your like you said your best own expert, um, that's a good sentiment to, for people to hold on to. Um, yeah. And we're not all chained inside. I mean, there are that you can go out and do things. So, um, but being proactive about your and staying active in your own care is is important. That's good. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, what would you say about, you know, with the, with the big emphasis right now on staying home, um, how, what about kind of things like structure day to day? What, what would you say are some important things in that arena? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because I talk to a lot of people who feel like one day really just blurs into the next, mm -hmm. you know, when we're spending so much of our life <laughs> at home inside the same four walls. Um, mm -hmm. 
Monday really blurs into Tuesday and into the whole rest of the week. So doing what you can to maintain some consistency and some routine, I think will really be helpful during this time. Um, so having a consistent time that you go to bed, waking up at a normal time during the week, um, just maintaining, as you said, some structure, I think mm -hmm. is, is really helpful. Um, you know, building some exercise into that if you can. And even if that's, I'm going to walk around the block and I'm going to spend 10 minutes walking. Um, I think we need to be mindful about building some exercise into our day because mm -hmm. again, staying inside those same four walls, we can get kind of sedentary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and some of these concepts are going to sound really fundamental, but they're, I think, really important to our well-being. You know, I'm asking folks that I meet with, you know, how are you eating? Are you eating regular meals? Um, how are you doing with taking your medications? Are you taking them at a consistent time each day? You know, if you tell me you take your medication in the morning, but on Monday you woke up at 8.30 and on Wednesday you woke up at noon, we start to lose some of that consistency and, uh, you know, start to lose some of the benefit of what we're doing. And so building that routine into your day is really important. And while it's monotonous, it's actually really quite helpful. Yeah, it makes sense. And I mean, I think that it, it's, like you said, it's fundamental. And then sometimes people, you know, we don't realize how much our schedule is anchored for us by our daily responsibilities. And so when you take that away, there's this kind of ambiguous, like, well, uh, Mondays are like Sundays. And so how do I fill that? And if you don't, it can get, it can slip away from you, the little things. Um, and like you said, sleep, wake schedule, locking that down is really important, but taking the time to the, it's, I think what, cause it seems like what can be difficult about this is it can seem so pedestrian about scheduling time to make sure you take your meds. Like you said, you have your structured meals, but if you don't do that, uh, it can really cause insidious problems over time. Um, so true. So that's, that's, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, mm -hmm. The, um, then, and what about, so um, I guess one question I, and talking with people so far, this hasn't really come up, but the, the kind of perspective or the, or the mental take on the situation itself, when people sit back and kind of reflect on it, um, what would you say about people's states of minds or kind of the perspective people have about the situation and any, anything to speak to about ways that might be helpful for people to think about the way the situation is, if that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think what you touched on earlier about kind of feeling this helplessness or this lack of control, that's, that's a consistent message that I do hear from people that I am interacting with. And I, I think that's very real. And I definitely want to validate that when I talk to folks, because there's a lot of our day-to-day -day decisions that have kind of been taken out of our hands. You know, businesses are currently closed or the way we go about getting our food is different. You know, a lot of those things have changed without our input. Mm -hmm. um, but there are still a lot of things that are within our control. And so I really, um, again, just want to empower people to look for those opportunities. Um, we need to honor and validate what's happening. And at the same time, we need to look for those opportunities to focus on what we can't control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I recently cut my own hair uh, and I, <laughs> it was not good. I cut it really short and realized also I'm having that uh, male pattern baldness happening. But, uh, <laughs> but one of the things I learned from the, from the pandemic is now I can start saving money on haircuts. <laughs> so I'm going to hold on to that silver lining. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, actually, so that right, one thing that... Um, you know, and you, and you and I kind of talked about this a bit before we started here, but um, the haircut thing reminds me of this is uh, things like you see this message a lot is like, this is an opportunity to master a new hobby or to incorporate mm. newness into your life. What, what, what's your take on that just broadly? Sure. Yeah. Anybody who's been on social media has probably been, you know, seeing the <laughs> memes that pop up about oh, that, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, and I really hope people laugh at that and don't take those seriously because that in my mind is a completely unrealistic expectation of <laughs> what life has given us. Yeah. Um, and in fact, if there's somebody out there who can master a new language or learn a new skill during this time, I'd really like to meet them. They're probably a pretty amazing individual. Jill, so you're not mastering Greek and Latin word root origins right now? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I did the laundry yesterday, Chad. That's what I did. <laughs> hey, incremental progress. That's the pragmatic stuff. <laughs> right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of that is just making a mental shift from this idea of working at home to working in a pandemic. And I'm really trying mm -hmm. to be intentional about using that phrase. Um, and I don't even know who to give credit to or who to thank for sending me the article. But a few weeks ago, I read an article that spoke to that. And man, mm -hmm. was that powerful. I think you can take credit. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you're synthesizing it in an original way. <laughs> But that was so incredibly helpful to think about. You know, I think sometimes this concept of working from home is kind of romanticized and perceived as being mm. this really cool and energizing um, opportunity to do something new and amazing and different. Um, a lot of times that, you know, is in the spirit of entrepreneurship and all those things. Mm -hmm. Right now, working from home is working in a pandemic. And that is a totally different scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and again, gets back to what we were talking about earlier, probably not by choice. Most of us didn't wake up on some given day in March and say, from this point forward for the foreseeable future, I'm working from home. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Most of us had to quickly adapt to the current environment. Um, so I think just really, again, focusing on the fact that Yes, you are working from home, but you are working in a pandemic. And it's more mm -hmm. about the broader context of that, um, which means you're not finding time in the day to do all these new and amazing hobbies and, you know, learn all these things or, you know, this bucket list of things that I was going to do someday. That bucket list is yeah. not probably happening now. Mm -hmm. um, and so if today all you did was eat your three meals, do your laundry and meet you and your family's basic needs, you've done exactly what you needed to do in a pandemic. It's, it's just think it's really helpful what you're saying about kind of staying grounded in terms of expectations and perspectives right now. The, you know, one, that whole cliche, one thing at a time, one day at a time. Uh, maybe it's not in terms of this context as people are actively suffering all the time, but just the idea of that kind of mindfulness right now. You know, if you set your sights like, okay, I need to, I need to master gardening or I need to learn, you know, the Russian language and I need to master the guitar. I mean, th those obviously, those endeavors are, are great if you're into it. But um, like you said, kind of staying grounded around you're working from home in a pandemic. And so the, the context is, is unique and there are there's ramifications for it. Because the other thing I think about with what you're saying is sometimes there's this over advocacy for, for like we all have to really hold on to how everything is great and everything is going to be okay. And sometimes it's okay just to just to be mindful about the way it is. You know, if, you're, if your day-to-day -day is, if it's okay, great. You know, there's no expectation you have to suffer. And then if you are suffering, being mindful and compassionate about that for yourself and for others. Um, that seems, that's just an important thing. But setting expectations, best case scenario, you meet them. But if you don't, it can create, you can manufacture problems. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I really think you should cite yourself because that working from in a, in a pandemic, that is delicious. <laughs> Good mindset. <laughs> well, um, time wise here, uh, I did have a few specific questions, if it's okay, about um, I just wanted to ask you before we wrap up here. Um, of course. So medication wise, um, do you have any pearls or any kind of things you'd want to share about um, such as like as needed medications, any, any sp particular things you think people should be thinking critically about right now in this context at all? Sure. You know, that's, that's not an unusual question for me to get. And it's, it's really something that I have to take on a case by case basis with each individual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a lot of medications available to us to help with the symptoms of anxiety and the benzodiazepines are probably some of the best known um, mm -hmm. for better or for worse because they're in the media quite a lot right now. Um, and while they are certainly powerful and effective, they're not the only medication we have available. And so I like to talk with folks about all the different medications that can help with anxiety. You know, some of the beta blockers and things that were actually intended to treat blood pressure could be quite marvelous for people who have those kind of body sensations and those physiological responses to being anxious. So those medications come into play. Um, some of the SSRIs that are well known for depression and anxiety are perfectly appropriate. Um, not necessarily on an as-needed schedule, but on more of a daily schedule. Um, and, you know, with the benzodiazepines, while they are effective, balancing them with some of the risks of long-term use, because they really um, are not intended to be used long-term and carry a certain amount of risk if used long-term. So really kind of balancing how much is the anxiety impairing your function today, and how do we compare that to the risk associated with what medication we choose to manage that. So. Um, so I, I love that you that. brought it up, but it's a really mm -hmm. kind of in-depth and complicated choice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're not a universal kind of take on it, but the, but a theme I heard you say there is about basically using judgment about weighing out functional impact versus the long-term risks if you do establish that kind of 
change to the schedule and you're taking it every day, et cetera. Um, but then like you said, it's, it's variable case by case. Um, what, uh, one question along those lines is when would be a good time, would you say, or what would be a sign or some signs when someone should maybe seek someone like yourself out to discuss that kind of medication? Absolutely. Um, that word functioning is really kind of key. You know, I think all of us just in experiencing life are going to have moments of anxiety and some of that's really healthy. Some of that is what um, motivates us to rise to the occasion and do what needs to be done um, or kind of cues us into something that's going to be potentially harmful and how we need to change what we're doing. Um, but if that anxiety approaches a level that is impairing your function, like you're literally overwhelmed and kind of frozen in a way, like I really can't perceive and function. I really can't make decisions. I'm really not getting out of bed and going about my day. I'm shutting myself off from people and I'm really not interacting because I'm so overwhelmed. If those really fundamental shifts in functioning happen, then we need to take a really good look at what we need to do and potentially add in medication. That's very helpful. Thanks for sharing that for folks. Yeah, um, for sure. The um, time-wise, so um, one thing I've, I've been asking most folks here is, is just kind of an insider sense about how COVID's impacted your practice. Um, sure. Yeah, anything you want to share just of note? Yeah, um, it's given me a whole new respect for my colleagues who do telemedicine on a regular basis. <laughs> I'll just say that. <laughs> That's well said, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, yeah, um, doing telemedicine was not what I envisioned for my practice, and yet I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just so happy that there's an opportunity and a safe platform for still meeting with my patients and delivering the care that is so very important right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still struggle with technology and I am admittedly a people person, not a tech person, but, um, but I'm, I'm glad to make it work. And right now I'm pretty much exclusively doing telemedicine. Um, okay. really not conducting any face-to-face -face appointments, at least in person. Um, because I think as we all know, the risk associated with gathering right now is just, um, just pretty high. So for those who can't do a zoom meeting, like what's going on right now, um, you know, the good old telephone works too. I have a handful of folks who I'm simply calling and conducting the appointment by phone. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I work with some of our case managers to get creative about finding ways to, to get in touch with people because depending on where they live and what resources they have, that's mm. um, a challenge. But uh, thankfully, thankfully, I'm in touch with people, whether it be um, via Zoom or via phone. Yeah, kind of able to adapt to the situation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, technology-wise, it's a good thing this isn't 30 years ago. So it's, <laughs> it's, uh, there's some perks to it. It's interesting, too, because the, the, similarly, I, it's all telehealth for me right now, too. And the, uh, this is the first time in my career where I have, like, one person, for example, that I'll never meet in person. And that's, oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, in our field, that's kind of interesting. So, um, for sure. Yeah, so it, it's been interesting. And, and you know, with, with the pandemic, um, it'll be curious to see when everything, when, when things are resolving, what things stick around and what things revert back to the way it was. And telehealth right. is interesting, just the amount of the spotlight that's on it right now um, to see where things go with that. Um, Absolutely. So, well, the last thing I was hoping to ask was um, how COVID maybe has impacted you personally and, and your family, if you're okay with, with sharing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so as the mom of two boys, I currently have school happening in my house every day. <laughs> so that's <laughs> right. been an interesting twist. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Not only bringing parents work into the home, but bringing school into the home. So um, as a family, we're figuring out how to make all that work and fit mm -hmm. together, much like many other families on the Palouse. So, and how old um, are your boys? Um, I have a 16 and a 13 year old. So middle school mm -hmm. and high school. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so yeah, so we're all adapting as best we can. And so far, no two weeks have looked the same. I like to think <laughs> that's because we learned something the week before and yeah. we're doing it better now, but yep. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have a lot of bandwidth issues with all the, all the internet these days. <laughs> At times. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. For sure. Um, yeah. And as you touched upon, you know, just in, in my work, I've had to learn to deliver services differently. Um, but I've also just kind of become aware of my own just vulnerability as an individual. Um, mm -hmm. I spent a few months of the month of March um, out of capacity, not working because I was sick with a respiratory illness that um, was presumed to possibly be COVID. I was tested, but was negative. 
Yeah. Um, at that point in time, testing wasn't widespread in Whitman County, but as a healthcare provider, um, I was priority for testing. Mm. And uh, so the test was negative, although I still believe a lot of my symptoms really fit with that and wow. have you know, some level of concern for the number of false negatives that we're hearing about with the test. Mm -hmm. But regardless of what the ultimate diagnosis was, um, it was just a, a really humbling reminder of my own vulnerability and how um, even though I perceive myself as a pretty healthy individual, I am not immune to illness. Mm -hmm. And so that's also been a really, um, a really helpful way for me to relate to folks I'm working with, you know, because we all share that vulnerability and having recently kind of lived through that and going through that struggle of getting back on my feet and feeling better physically. Um, it's really just kind of given me a whole new appreciation for what we're all facing. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's, that sounds like the word that comes to mind is kind of a healthy, humbling experience about um, vulnerability. And then, and then it sounds like it's, you know, it probably has prompted some ability to, like you're saying, connect with people, what they're going through, but that's firsthand experience. Um, and of course it's, it's fantastic. It was negative, uh, but it sounds sure. like maybe you're not sure, but, um, but man, that's, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a heavy thing. Um, do you remember how you felt emotionally during that time with the uncertainty and? Yeah. You know, the, the anxiety was pretty significant um, sure. when you when you don't know for sure what your diagnosis is in the beginning when you're waiting for test results to come back when you don't know how much longer it's going to be before you feel better mm -hmm. when you're trying to maintain some level of isolation from your children so you're not infecting oh, them yeah. mm -hmm. um, all those things were anxiety producing and I think you know looking back some of the level of fatigue and exhaustion um, came directly from that anxiety. I mean, of course I felt poorly physically, um, but anxiety certainly takes a toll too. So what was it like with, you know, with you and your family when you kind of cleared that, that period of time when your health was recovering and um, yeah. Yeah. It, it really just felt like the weight was kind of lifted. We were all, you know, just kind of stuck at home. We literally couldn't leave until we had my test results. Um, because that was before some things closed the way they are now. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was just this wave of relief that came like, oh, okay, well now we can leave the house. Um, that was also overshadowed by this, but I don't feel great, so I don't want to leave the house. So yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Mm. Well, I'm glad you recovered and uh, that turned out well. I mean, like I said, negative test results or not, you know, you're, you're healthy and, and moving forward. So I'm really glad to hear that. And thank you yeah. for sharing that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to have that behind me. <laughs> Well, Jill, thank you very much for the interview. Um, you know, in terms of Palouse River Counseling, again, the, um, we kind of spoke to your role there as the psychiatric ARMP, but I, I did want to take a moment to ask kind of what, about filling people in about the services available there, what kind of options, what's available, and maybe not just now, but also as things kind of resolve over time and open more up, uh, but maybe giving some folks some info about PRC and the operation and services available. Yeah, I'd love to. Um... As the Community Mental Health Center for the county, I hope that folks will think of us for a whole variety of things. Um, we have several teams of professionals, everything from a children's team to an adult team, so we can literally serve all ages. Um, within our adult services, we have a pretty wide variety there as well because we have some case managers for folks who are living with the more chronic and persistently um, mentally ill issues and need that level of support. Um, we've got a good team of folks who are doing outpatient therapy with our adults. Um, so giving that help with anxiety, depression, things of that sort. Um, we have a team of substance use counselors who are doing both individual and uh, group treatment for folks who need to tackle a substance use issue. Mm -hmm. And we are also the crisis service provider for the county. So if anybody were to call in after hours, arrive to the ER, mm -hmm. um, you know, have interaction with law enforcement where law enforcement wanted mental health help. Um, we are the agency that would respond in that situation as well. So, um, you know, folks are actually welcome to call our number literally 24 seven because we've got an on-call system that will get you in touch mm -hmm. uh, with somebody immediately. And so there's resources 24 seven. That's great. That's a, that's a great option for folks. Um, yeah. And I remember the, when I was back after residency, I was uh, at, 
the fellowship at health and wellness, we were doing, uh, uh, myself and Kate Gogger did one, like one night a week of uh, kind of the, for the student body, the initial consult at ED. And so there was a couple of times where I interacted with folks from PRC and it was always a, a really good interaction and a lot of very thoughtful people who are very patient focused. Um, mm. So it's, it's um, you guys have a lot to offer. So I, I hope people will continue to seek you guys out for, for care. Um, and I, I shouldn't make a dark joke, but the substance use thing, because you, you know, part of your operation that's big is the substance use treatment and right. with the COVID stay at home thing and all the jokes about how, you know, substance use is up, alcohol delivery sales are up. If that's, you know, if when this starts to resolve, if people are struggling with that and, and having a hard time, maybe getting back to baseline or, you know, you guys are going to be an excellent resource to seek out if people need that and, and not to hesitate for that. That's actually sure. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, Joel, thank you so much for the interview. Um, and I re really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks again for the opportunity. Anyway, my pleasure. All right. Take All care. Right. You Bye. too, Chad.